Okay, thank you so much, Laura, for this very gracious, very generous introduction. It's a, for me, it's a great honor to give a talk honoring Dr. Hunt, you know, who has been a major pioneer in this field. Actually, I've been aware of his work for a very long time, his seminal work on, on dealing on, on, the, on the environment. Uh, 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 introduced the concept to them to be extremely innovative, extremely far-reaching. So my, my talk today is mostly on anti-angiogenesis, because as things turn out, this, you know, at least in, in the particular particular area where I work to now to be a, a more clinically kind of a, a successful proposition. But we did lots of work actually in trying to, reg uh, to regenerate you know, blood vessels with the purpose you know, to, 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 to treat, for example, limb ischemia, coronary ischemia, even a wound dealing. And I will a little bit to briefly illustrate you know, some of this work. But first, you know, let me tell you, of course, the idea that blood vessels are important is not really a new idea at all. You know, the idea exists you know, for millennia probably. People have known for a long time, if you severe an artery, your limb will fall off when they undergo gangrene. But the idea that blood vessels can play a negative role, too many blood vessels could lead you know, to disease, is much more recent, actually, maybe like a century or so ago. And actually, this is a, a, one of the seminal paper that you know, I, can, I found, a paper published in 1939, extremely innovative idea. They utilized what at, at that time was a new, newly developed you know, a, 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 um, a device, which was a transparent you know, chamber, which is essentially the equivalent of you know, intravital microscopy today. And so this investigator introduced a tumor in one of these transparent you know, chamber implanted in, in the rabbit here. You know, and, they, uh, and actually, the idea was that they they test you know, the, the hypothesis that you know, one of the mechanisms which allow tumor cells you know, to survive you know, in, a, in a different environment once they metastasize is the ability to recruit you know, blood vessels, which allow them you know, to, de to obtain nutrients, etc. And, 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 and actually, they, they found that you know, the tumor impl implant in this transparent chamber, so they could look you know, in, in non-invasive way at any time. You know. There was this extensively neovascular supply. You can say this is the tumor in the middle. And this is actually, this, uh, after eight days, this very extensive vascular supply. And they, they, they uh, speculate in this paper that the tumor must be elaborating a, a blood vessel growth you know, stimulating factor, which turned out to be obviously a very uh, uh, insightful idea. Uh, and this was in 1939. And, uh, and there is another seminal paper published in the 40s or in, in the late 40s. You know. At the time, obviously, this, this work you know, was necessarily descriptive because the technology to purify factor or to do cloning did not exist at that time. And actually, we should also acknowledge a really a major pioneer in this field with this uh, Dr. Judah Falkman, who essentially brought you know, this idea again to the map. He is essentially he communicated you know, this early paper in an extremely effective way. And also, is the, I believe, the first one to have you know, proposed you know, the idea that you know, targeting angiogenesis could have a therapeutic significance. You know. This is a 1971 paper in the New England Journal of Medicine communicated this idea all over the place and then you can find in any uh, 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 any medical school everybody had you know the New England Journal of Medicine at disposal. But certainly, uh, proposing the idea was easy. It was easier said, you know, than done. The one is to do a lot of work, you know, a lot of basic research, you know, to identify this molecule. The idea would be uh, identify this angiogenic factor, this uh, mediator of blood vessel growth, and potentially targeting them. You know, at that time it, it, there was a formidable challenge, you know, uh, to, 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 to do all of that. You know, uh, you need, you know, to based on the technology of the period, you need, you know, to purify a protein, you know, essentially to homogenate, you know. Because based on the technology, that period that was required, you know, to uh, achieve a critical milestone, which was ob obtained, you know, an amino acid sequence. The amino acid sequence could uh, enable, you know, cloning. You know, so all this work could take, you know, ten years. Now, of course, all of this is completely obsolete. You know, they are extremely powerful. You know proteomic and genomic technology. But this is what, you know, it took. And by the, the 80s, this is what really people have described, you know, many um, um, angiogenic factors, actually. Uh, this is a, an incomplete, you know, table. One of the molecules, for example, is basic FGF, actually. Andrew Bird, which actually is a member of the society, was one, one of the, the people that, you know, first, you know, isolate and sequence, you know, basic FGF, actually, which was, of course, enable, you know, cloning. But there is a, a, a series of other factors, you know, and, uh, but it was 
believe that, you know, that even though this molecule were had the potent, you know, effect, you know, as a pharmacological, it was not totally clear, you know, to what extent you know, they play an endogenous role, you know, in, in angiogenesis, because there are some, you could not even block, you know, this factor, it was not always possible to show that, you know, actually had, you know, an effect, you know. And that's how our work, you know, came from a totally different field, you know, from a very unexpected, you know, I was, actually, I was a postdoc at the UCSF, actually, in, 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 the, in, the, part, in the Department of Reproductive Endocrinology. My interest was the pituitary gland, you know. I was uh, fortunate to isolate in those years, I'm talking about the 1983, 84, some pretty obscure cells in the pituitary. Even now, even today, they are relatively obscure, you know. They are called follicular stellate cells, which form this kind of network which look much like glial cells, you know. And, and even some early pioneers, like this paper published in 1972, they pointed out that the cells have some kind of intimate relationship with the blood vessels, you know. They ended up in this kind of projection of in, in close place, some sort of role, you know, actually in organizing, you know, the vasculature of the pituitary. And, and, and I was able to isolate, you know, a pure culture of these cells from bovine pituitary. I tested, you know, at the time, this crazy idea to test, you know, the supernatal of these cells, you know, on endothelial cells. Lo and behold, there was a huge, you know, mitogenic effect. And that was really drove me to continue this effort. I, you know, when I was at UCSF, and then actually, I was very fortunate, you know, to join Genentech in 1988, because this is immensely facilitated my work. And I want, you know, to overly take credit, because I was at disposal of incredible protein sequencing facility, great, you know, colleagues and cloning. At, after six months after I joined Genentech, we had already an amino acid sequence of VEGF, you know, which enabled you know, cloning, which is described here, actually. Uh, we, uh, so, the, so this molecule actually was, it, it was, it was a real molecule at the time when we initially reported our work was a novel molecule, which did not have any match in any database. You know. And we call VEGF you know, to uh, signify the fact that it seems to be specific for endothelial cells. You don't need to look at this details, simply you know, show that you know, this is a bovine and this is a human VEGF. There is over 90% identity between these two molecules. And so this is what, and, and then after our work was, uh, was published, we, we discovered the story was a little bit more complicated you know, than that. We discovered that in 1983, a group at Harvard led you know, by Harold you know, Dvorak you know, identified a, a protein, we actually, they, they call it vascular permeability factor, which uh, 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 was able to induce, you know, uh, rapidly induced you know, vascular leakage. In this early study, they were, they were unable to isolate you know, this, this protein. Actually, as you can see, it took you know, seven years until they were able to fully purify and, and sequence it. You know. It showed what a formidable challenge it was you know, to purify a protein. But, you know, and so for all these years, you know, the sequence of VPF was unknown. So that's why I think we didn't find you know, this molecule in any database when we initially isolated you know, VEGF. But clearly, this is also another important activity of this protein actually can regulate angiogenesis it can also you know in some cases regulate you know, vascular permeability which are really two critical you know process happening in, in, in vascular biology and so this is what we know about you know VEGF you know there is actually this illustrate you know the structure it's a it's a nomodimer you know uh, which has some similarity with the PDGF which is another very important molecule in wound dealing you know in and in vascular biology and uh, uh, and, and actually this is now uh, uh, over 20 years later I think we knew, we know we understand much more about you know VEGF how, how it works you know we know that you know there are some receptor there is some tyrosine kinase, you know, receptor, which mediate, you know, the, the VEGF, you know, signaling, actually. Without going into too many details, which probably could be a little bit, you know, take a long time, I will say that now that there is actually a key receptor is the one which mediate, you know, the signal of VEGF, which is called VEGF receptor 2, which is actually is a tyrosine kinase, you know. And uh, VEGF, which now is called VEGFA, is the prototype member of a family, actually, which include, you know, other molecules like a PD, VEGF, you know, V, PLGF, you know, as well as VEGF, you know, C and VEGF, you know, D, actually. And VEGF, C and D also is a very important in other process, which is called a very important for wound healing, which is a lymphangiogenesis, you know. And, and actually, there is a number of the disease where there is a lymphedema.
lymphedema. Lymphedema has been associated with a mutation in VEGF receptor 3. So it is very remarkable that this, uh, uh, this family of factors can regulate some critical component of angiogenesis, hemangiogenesis and lymphangiogenesis. But what my work has been focused is mostly, is mostly in actually in the hemangiogenesis. And now there is a number of inhibitors of this pathway, including you know, antibody to the ligand as well as uh, antibody to receptor and many tyrosine kinase, you know, uh, in a small molecule kinase inhibitor. There are today uh, uh, at least, you know, 12, you know, drugs, you know, approved by the FDA, which are targeted on this pathway. Um, um, of course, I don't want, you know, to imply for a moment that VEGF is the only molecule involved in vascular development. Now we understand it's a very complex, you know, process. There is a multiple molecule, like, you know, uh, which include, you know, member of the Notch, you know, family, the Efrin family. And actually, the, the work done on the last, you know, decade, actually, more than a decade ago, is clearly illustrating, you know, there is this segregation between arterial and venous differentiation which seems to be primarily dictated you know, by different members of the Efrin family. You know, but you know, clearly, the VEGF is a critical rate-limiting step because it's, uh, it's FLIC1 is the name of you know, the mouse you know, VEGF receptor is really present in the, in the, in the common progenitor elements you know, which result you know, in, the, in, in, in that. You know. And this actually, even though the study was published now <laughs> over 20 years ago, still is the, probably the experiment which best illustrates you know, the importance of VEGF in physiology. This is the VEGF, you know, knockout. You know, this is the wild type, you know, uh, 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 which has a botin of VEGF allele. You can see there is this very nice vascular supply in the yolk, uh, yolk sac of mice. These are the blood islands. And this is a VEGF, you know, mutant, which lacks only, which has only one allele of VEGF. You know, so there is still 50% of VEGF, and yet it's not compatible with embryonic development. So this is one of very rare examples of, you know, really aploinsufficiency which result in embryonic lethality. Uh, most of the times you need, you know, knockout of both allele to have a phenotype. So this is a very critical molecule in, in embryonic development. And also, the result other very important aspect of the of a VEGF, you know. Now we know that you know v, the VEGF, you know, gene, like you know, many genes can alter, undergo alternative exon splicing, which result, you know, in the generation of multiple form of VEGF. You know, actually, uh, VEGF 121 up to the VEGF, you know, 206. Actually, uh, so this this molecule are very different in amino acid in, in, in length, you know. But there is a critical difference, you know, which is affinity for heparin. You know, VEGF 121, which is the smallest you know, form, does not have any significant affinity for heparin. As you know, VEGF 189 and 206 have a two heparin binding domain. So they are tightly sequestered in, 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 in the extracellular matrix. They're not very diffusible molecules. Instead, what is really the workhorse of the system is VEGF 165, which is a partially diffusible, a, a partially bound, you know, because it's one heparin binding domain. So this, uh, this isoform, the interplay of this isoform is generating you know, this biochemical gradients, which are especially extremely important, for example, during wound dealing, when it's important to recruit you know, blood vessels you know, toward you know, the ischemic area. And, and, and there is another very important aspect which regulates, actually, the bioavailability of VEGF, and is certainly very important in wound dealing, which is proteolysis. You know. This is an early study, actually, our lab you know, did in the early 90s, showed that you know, a, a key protease like you know, plasmin, which actually resulted from plasminogen activation, which is so prominent in this condition of uh, wound dealing you know, and, and angiogenesis, cleaving of VEGF in the carboxino terminus, and, and essentially result in this peptide under 110, 110, which is uh, very similar to 121, in, in that it's very diffusible, you know, and it's enable angiogenesis actually in, in, in this circumstance. It's, there is a now growing evidence that this, you know, smaller peptide could be very important in, in this pat pathophysiological condition, like, you know, macular degeneration, wound healing, and other things. All of this seems to be very simple, actually. And then in a few years ago came another hypothesis, actually, seems to provide a new, completely new view of the, the, the VEGF isoform, work done by a group, you know, 
in the UK that you know, claim that there is also some anti-angiogenic isoforms. Uh, some splice product of the EGF could, uh, could actually, the opposite effect can do to, to inhibit the angiogenesis. In particular, this VEGF 165B, there is a, based on an unusual splicing you know, in, in the carboxy terminus resulting in a molecule which inhibit angiogenesis. Much of this work turned out to be a little bit you know, controversial. And more recently, there was another claim you know, that you know, there is a, actually an extending of form of VEGF, you know, called VEGF AX, actually was published in a very prominent journal in Cell. You know. There is this extension you know, because of, which, uh, uh, of the tw uh, with the 22 amino acids which inhibit, angioge inhibit angiogenesis. We took a look you know, at this data, and actually this shows how sometimes you know, even what is published in the most you know, prominent journal is not always you know, the gospel, actually. We try to reproduce this data. And actually, to our surprise, this uh, VEGF AX was essentially very potent, not quite as potent as uh, VEGF 165, but clearly stimulate angiogenesis, even in vitro as well as in, in vivo. And we provide a mechanistic explanation without going into many details, is, is because you know, this VEGF AX simply does not interact with the key core receptor called a neuropilin. So it's not an inhibitor of angiogenesis, it's simply less you know, potent you know, induced of angiogenesis. So I, I, I feel essentially, I, I believe that VEGF is an angiogenic factor. So far, this anti-angiogenic molecule probably uh, d d d do not exist. You know. This is actually a, a slide which is probably very familiar to a group you know, in, in interested in wound healing because it illustrates you know, the hypoxic regulation of uh, not only of VEGF, but a variety of other genes. Actually, this daily work, you know, by the beautiful work by Dr. Hunt, you know, study extensive I I hypoxia and the production of lacti lactate, you know, which is stimulating you know, actually angiogenesis. Without going into many details because it's very complex, you know, but you know, this is is an extremely important work, actually. The discovery of this pathway last year won the last year award, you know, Greg Semenza, uh, 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 Bill Kelly, and, and uh, as well as uh, Peter Radcliffe. There is an uh, interplay between a key transcription factor called HIF, you know, and the VHL, you know, tumor suppressor, actually. If, you know, stimulating, interacting with the promoter of some key genes, like, you know, VEGF stimulate angiogenesis, you know, actually. But it's degraded, you know, by the VHL, you know, protein, actually. Inactivating mutation in this VHL you know, protein resulting in angiogenesis even in normoxic condition, which is what happened in actually in the von hippel lindau syndrome as well as in some tumors like renal cell carcinoma. But this is a fundamental pathway, actually. But you know, going back actually to the initial idea that you know angiogenesis could be also uh, not only could be useful to inhibit angiogenesis, but could be very important to promote angiogenesis. And actually, we put uh, actually lots of effort in the 90s in, in actually exploring this idea. And this is actually a publication, actually still is a very high, highly cited you know, publication, work that, you know, done, you know, actually in, in collaboration with Dr. Jeff Isner, who was a cardiologist at, at actually St. Elizabeth Hospital in, in Boston. At the time, it, this was a extremely visible area of research. Our contribution was mostly supply reagents like VEGF. And, and the study shows some very tantalizing effect of recombinant in you know, VEGF you know, actually in a rabbit ischemic limb, limb model. Even a single in, in arterial administration of VEGF result in what seems to be a very strong you know, angiogenic effect. You know, this is the control you know, group, you know, and this is actually the VEGF you know, treating you know, animals at different time points. You know, and uh, uh, this seems to be a very remarkable effect. You know. And Dr. Isner went to, uh, up all the way to do some clinical experiment, a clinical trial. There is a, this is one of those studies, actually. Uh, 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 in, uh, uh, this was a gene therapy trial using nicotinoplasmin you know, DNA without any, any actually any viral vector, etc. And, and, and the study reported you know, that there is actually a very significant increase in collateral vessel growth you know, in a patient with ischemic limbs. It looks very, very, a, 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 a very strong effect. You know. 
Um, 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 uh, and there is also another line of research which suggests you know, that you know, VEGF, as well as I, I should point out a very similar result we were obtaining with other, other angiogenic factor, like a basic FGF, for example. This then seems to be unique you know, to VEGF. This is study said that Mike, Michael Simons, actually, uh, at the time was at, you know, also, also in Boston, and he showed that you know, some very remarkable that uh, even a single in, uh, administration of a, of a couple of micrograms of VEGF, it has a very dramatic effect you know, in a myocardial ischemia model. You know, in, 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 uh, this is a porcine model, which was thought to be much higher bar you know, than, the, than the rabbit you know, model. There is a, an improvement, a functional improvement in a variety of parameters. This is Nature Medicine paper. You know. And actually, the study was so provocative that convinced you know, Genentech to do a clinical trial, you know, actually, with the recombinant VEGF in, uh, actually in coronary ischemia. And the study was called the VIVA trial, actually. It was actually conducted in the late 90s. It was published, I think, in 2000 and two, yeah, 2003, actually, by a group, you know. And the study actually uh, in the consisted in, in a single intracoronary infusion of VEGF followed by, by some intravenous administration. The truth is, the, the matter of it, actually, the, the nice things about this study was a placebo control in a trial, actually. Uh, it, it was a two-dose group of VEGF. The conclusion was that this trial was a completely negative. Uh, the, what the people discovered, there is an enormous placebo effect in this trial, you know. Things that everybody was saying, like a doctor Isner or Dr. Simons, it is unprecedented a patient that can improve, you know, without a, a, an, an effective terror. It's that we discovered how powerful the placebo effect was. And, and the same was true for the clinical trial done by Dr. Isner. When, when a placebo was introduced, there was simply nothing there. This was an extremely disappointing thing that we discovered. There was, a, there was a, a, some very, at that time, a very, I believe, very commendable effort in, even in promoting wound dealing, actually. This publication done by Dr. Galliano, which is a member of this society, actually, in collaboration with my colleague Stuart Banting at Genentech. You know, they report, for example, that you know, in a mouse model of, of wound dealing, there was a very significant effect, you know, a very profound effect. There is no question about that. You know. This is actually the, the control, and this is the VEGF you know, group. You know. This is in a, in, a, in a model of a diabetic, you know, uh, um, in a diabetic model, and so there was a strong, you know, promotion of undealing, and, and actually, and actually, Genentech, you know, conducted a, what they call at that time a clinical experiment, which was a large, you know, phase one study, would be approximately 50 patients, you know, actually a little over 50 patients, you know, with half, you know, placebo and half, you know, the treatment group with the, with the VEGF in patients with a diabetic also. And this initial study was, I believe, tantalizing. Even though it didn't reach, you know, statistically significant, there was a very strong, you know, trend, you know, in all parameters looked, you know, uh, 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 you show that, you know, the telbermine, which is the name given to recombinant VEGF, you know, there was actually complete wound dealing, you know, in 41% versus 29% in the placebo group. And that led you know, to, a, to, a fa to a large, you know, phase two study, which I don't believe has ever been published. But unfortunately, the study was negative. It, this really led... Uh, it essentially makes the point that you know this this early study, you know, the idea that you give a growth factor and, and, and by itself, you know, can pro, can have a profound effect in the cardiovascular regenerative med medicine. Maybe was a little bit you know simplistic. Maybe with you know newer formulation or newer uh, effort, you know, in tissue engineering, the result could be could be different. But this is what this is another uh, another study which I think is it was also very tantalizing. You know, actually, it almost went to clinical trial. You know. VEGF, you know, strongly promote, you know, bone healing, bone repair, you know. This is a, in a rabbit model. This is, you can, the, 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 the image is very self-explanatory. This is the control, you know, group, you know, and this is the VEGF, you know, treat, treat, you know, group. But there is a very profound effect, you know. And I, I will say that if you block, you know, VEGF, you know, you can see something which is very consistent with that. You inhibit wound healing, you know, at the, some stage of development, actually, you inhibit, actually, uh, bone growth. So this is what we learned in, in, in those days, and I think there was some very important concept, but clearly we need you know, to learn how to do, uh, it, would be, it would be wonderful if one day when we come back you know, to the studies and, and, and revisit you know, them in light of newer notions of you know, formulation and tissue engineering. So let's, let's go back to what we really, uh, we found that there's some benefit in humans actually, try to block angiogenesis along this very early studies by, by this 
this early pioneer by Dr. Falkman. This is the expression of VEGF you know, in human tissue, actually. This is an affimetric genealogic database, actually. This is the expression of VEGF in normal you know, uh, uh, disease you know, tissue as well as in invasive cats. You can see there is immediately tissue that stands out, which is actually the kidney, because we know that renal cell cancer in, in over 50% of the cases have this VHL mutation, which result in VEGF upregulation. And actually, this is really, uh, uh, and, and this is led, you know, actually, this is actually very earlier study than that. This is a study which we, we published in 1993. This was actually the, fir the very first, you know, study probing, probing the in vivo role of VEGF, you know. We developed a monoclonal antibody against the human VEGF, you know, actually, and, and we did at that time, this is a very simple experiment to inject, you know, human tumor cell line in immunodeficient mice and treating this mice either with a control antibody or with, you know, or with the, uh, this anti-VEGF antibody. And you can see that there is a very profound inhibition of a tumor growth. At that time, this was very, very surprising because everybody expected that you have a, an inhibition of a tumor growth, you need to block you know, many angiogenic factors, maybe a, a, a dozen or so. Instead, in this experiment, it seems that this was a, a effective. You know. And this is actually this early study, uh, I, I'm jumping or skipping you know, 15 years or so. There was a, a very uh, replicate, you know, there was a lots of progress. And this led you know, to the idea that they humanize the, this, the same anti VEGF anti, anti, antibody using those preclinical study could perhaps represent a therapy. And this is actually turned out to be something that work. You know, this is a study published in, 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 in 2004. Actually, it was presented at the ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, in 2003. Show the blocking of VEGF with this humanized antibody in combination with the chemotherapy result in a meaningful survival benefit in patients with colon cancer, actually. What is interesting in this study was done without a biomarker. At this day, a biomarker is very critical, so show the effect was robust, you know. In, in uh, 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 Bevacizumab, and how this drug is called, actually it's called Avastin today, was up subsequently approved by the FDA. It's still, in, after, uh, now almost you know, 14 years, is still a standard of therapy in multiple lines of colon cancer, actually. I'm not going to go over too many cancer data because I know it's outside you know, the interest of this, of, of this society. But I will say that you know, Avastin has been approved you know, by the FDA for nine different indications, including you know, this is a case, for example, of ovarian cancer. The most recent uh, 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 approval was actually in, in December for another type of ovarian cancer. And actually, uh, the, 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 this slide is illustrating you know, the complexity, the fact that you can have you know, multiple players in, in, in the vessel wall, you know, actually, uh, not only the VEGF receptor, but even actually uh, uh, the tyrosine kinase re receptor, which could be potentially useful to block. You know. But the, 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 I'm, I'm not going to describe in, in detail all this effort, actually, our lab, you know, Focus on actually another very critical player, which is the microenvironment. Just like the tumor microenvironment is a, is a very important, is a source of factor cell type. Just like the microenvironment in, in the wound, you know, you have multiple cell type, multiple players. There is lots of similarity, lots of analogy between these two uh, ecosystem. And actually, we discovered that you know the, 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 the microenvironment could be a source, for example, of resistance to VEGF inhibitor because you can have you know. A, additional players, you know, the involvement of the bone marrow in, 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 all, in, in, in the system. Actually, without going into too many details, our lab, you know, focused over the last, you know, actually maybe 10 years in trying to understand, you know, what cell type are important, which can mediate, you know, angiogenesis after VEGF has been blocked. You know. And we found that there is some, cells, some myeloid cells, you know, mostly at least in some animal model of the neutrophil lineage, you know. And, and we, we, we found that, you know, a key myeloid, you know, factor, which is called a GCSF, actually uh, 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 mobilizing myeloid cells in the tumor microenvironment and actually resulting actually in the, in the homing of cells in which produce alternative angiogenic factor. One of these factors is one that our lab, you know, contributed you know, to discovery. But, you know, uh, and, and this il simply illustrates, you know, actually the, the multiple player, you know, uh, produced by this myeloid cells, which could result, you know, in a VEGF independent angiogenesis, not only, you know, 
the GF and other, other, other protein factor, actually, which result in angiogenesis. And actually, when, uh, without going in a lot of details, actually, I will say that you know, today, uh, immunotherapy seems to be a very promising approach in cancer therapy. Immune checkpoint inhibitor made possible, for example, in melanoma, resulting you know, maybe in a, in a, in a significant per percent of patient in, in, a, in a, almost in a cure you know, for, for melanoma. And, and, and there is evidence that blocking you know, VEGF actually facilitate, you know, immunotherapy because promoting, you know, the entry of, of a lymphocytes in the tumor microenvironment, you know, and actually could provide the substrate, you know, actually for additivity. And there is some very recent data show that, in fact, you know, that an antibody to anti pdl one which is one of the key uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitor in combination with the vast, you know, result, you know, in, uh, in increasing, you know, uh, um, omega of T cells uh, resulting in, in uh, there is some very recent data presented AACR actually showed that there is a very significant additivity. My last in a few minutes I would like to illustrate it would be certainly a serious error not to mention this data because I think they are probably the most you know, really important you know, actually uh, success of the, the anti-angiogenic field in my view. The role of the VEGF you know, play actually in, in some eye disease you know, which result in blindness like for example the diabetic retinopathy the proliferative diabetic the, the, the retinopathy. You don't need to be an ophthalmology to appreciate you know this extensive vascular proliferation in the in the in the, in the diabetic retina actually you see this uh, lots of area of uh, hemorrhagic area there is this uh, tortuosity extensive you know abnormalities of this blood vessels and in fact, you know, in, in the, 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 this, this vessels can re result in fibrosis, you know, which can result in retinal detachment and, and blindness. And actually, and then over 20 years ago now, in collaboration with a group in Boston, actually, we were able to measure, you know, the level of VEGF in the eye fluid of patients with the ischemic retinal disease, like the diabetic retinopathy, the retinopathy of prematurity. And you can, the, the, and we found at the time that there was almost a striking correlation between the level of VEGF in proliferative disease, you know, in, uh, so you can see it's a very high inactive proliferative diabetic retinopathy in the, in the range of several nanograms, and it's undetectable in, in the absence of, of diabetic retinopathy. And what was very remarkable become undetectable when the disease has become quiescent, you know. So there was, of course, this at the time were purely correlative study, but sometimes an animal model can be very meaningful. This is an animal model of actual ischemic retinal disease in, in the mind. You know, it is a, a laser induced you know, occlusion of a central retinal vein, which results in the ischemia of the retina. You know. And in the control you know, group, you know, there is this profound, you know, actually, neovascularization in the iris, which is, is called, which mimics the rubiosis of iris, which is a complication of the diabetic retinopathy. And this is the animals treating, you know, the, group, the eye of an animal treating you know, with this anti VEGF antibody. There is in this, in this early study, almost 100% inhibition of, you know, neovascularization. At that time, however, there was lots of people who were very skeptic that this data could be really predictive because in, in this animal model, everything happens within a few weeks, you know. Instead, in humans, take years to develop, you know, all these things. So people thought maybe this is a purely one dealing response that, you know, somehow VEGF is implicated. That took a lot, long time to convince, you know, people, you know, to develop actually a VEGF, you know, based, you know, therapy. It does, this illustrates you some really the, uh, the deficit, you know, in, in some key disease, you know, this is actually normal vision. You know. This is the vision of patient with a diabetic retinopathy. You can see that it's mostly the peripheral retina which is affected. Instead, you know, the central vision, which is a response, which allow one to read, you know, to write, etc., et is somewhat, you know, sparing. But there is another disease which is called age related to macular degeneration, which is historically has been the leading cause of actual blindness in the elderly population. In this case, you know, the peripheral vision is somewhat you know, okay, but what is really severely compromised is the cent central vision. So this individual could be otherwise healthy, you know, but cannot, you know, cannot, cannot you know, drive, he cannot read, he cannot, it, it is an extremely really uh, 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 serious condition. Even a very lesion of relatively limited size, provided 
it affect you know, the macula which is in, involved you know, in central vision have you know, this problem. And at the time, you know, there was actually, even though the evidence implicating you know, VEGF you know, in, in AMD was not clearly nearly as strong as the ischemic retinal disease, but still led you know, to, the, to the idea that you know, to, 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 to engineering a molecule which would be potentially used you know, for this clinical trial. At the time, what, you know, what we thought of doing to use you know, an antibody you know, fragment, not you know, the full length antibody. The idea was that the full length antibody, as a, a many people know, contains some moieties like in NFC, which uh, can activate, you know, complement the result in binding with the FC receptor. Things which could be very useful if the antibody wants to fight, you know, pathogens. But in some cases, it can result, you know, in tissue destruction. So at that time, no one had ever, 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 ever developed an antibody on a long-term basis in the human eye. So we thought that removing completely all these moieties, using only the FAB, could be potentially safer. At that time, really, this concept, this all theoretical consideration. And so we're engineering a, 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 an, an antibody fragment based on, on, on Avastin, which by virtue of phi mutation was even more potent than the full length antibody. And this is actually one of the phase three studies with the, this antibody called ranibizumab or lucentis, actually in patients with macular degeneration, actually. Uh, 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 the vision is measured on a chart, actually. This is actually not a placebo, but this was at that time a standard therapy, which was the, the photodynamic therapy. You can see there is a little bit of increase in visual acuity, and that there is this uh, progressive visual loss. You know. Instead, the, each one of the two uh, dosino you know, group of ranibizumab, you know, 0.3 and 0.5 milligram, actually there is a little bit of a dose response here. They showed this a very remarkable increase in visual acuity, which was maintained actually after two years. And this was a really unprecedented because the best that people expected you know, was uh, to result in a certain slowdown on visual loss. Instead, it looks about, you know, 35 to 40 percent of patients have a very substantial increase in visual acuity. About you know 30 percent have stable vision, and about you know 30 percent have very little, very limited response. And actually now with the, 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 the study we're actually extended, actually we know that there is really not only in clinical trial, but even in the real world that there is actually some, some long-term you know, benefit actually. As a scientist, I feel that, that, that to me this is the most you know, reward you know, effect of this line of research. This is a study conducted you know, in Denmark, you know, which uh, 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 measured the incidence rate of blindness you know, either, uh, uh, due either to, to macular degeneration, this, this line on top, or to cause and relate you know, to macular degeneration. And as you can see, this, the, the, this line is remaining relatively steady over the years. Instead, the incidence rate of, of, of blindness due to AMD is dropped by about you know, 50%, you know, coincidence, as the, the paper shows, to the introduction in 2006 of you know, this uh, intravitreal VEGF inhibitor. So there has been a very uh, the, the real effect. You know. It is actually a study conducted in the United States by the NIH, it's called the CAT you know, study actually the five year outcome you know, of, of visual acuity you know, in, in patients with AMD and the study showed that you know after five years 50 percent of the patients have a good innovation. 2040 or better, actually. With the 2040 vision, it's still possible to read, you know, to write, even to obtain a driver's license. And about, you know, actually 10% have a 2020 you know, vision. To put, you know, this number in context in, in the pre ntv era, already at, at one year, uh, only 10% only of patients had the 2040 you know, vision. At five years, would have been very rare to find anyone a good vision. Actually, this is the last, you know, sense of, of, of this paper show the result would have been unimaginable in the era before the availability of anti VEGF agent. I think this is very, very nice that this has been possible. And not only in, in AMD, it looks that perhaps you know, even, even greater benefit you know, in diseases like you know, the diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema. AMD is an extremely difficult disorder in which the neovascularization is only a component. There is actually inflammation, there is a mutation in the complement pathway. Yes, I just have like to conclude you know, the stock, actually, I think hopefully we're still on time, you know, uh, what has been the impact of VEGF in inhibitors on disease? First of all, I believe that the VEGF research has been very important in vascular biology. We learn a lot of, you know, concept, you know, 
the previously were not entirely clear actually. But there has been a benefit you know, in humans, you know, totally in, as an anti-agenogenic therapy for tumors, there is a benefit you know, in, in multiple tumors. But clearly there is no doubt that the, the, more, the, the greater benefit has been in, in dye. That has been exquisitely responsive to anti-VEGF you know, therapy. And there is a still a lot of work to do. I identify uh, some biomarkers, you know, establish some optimal combination actually we could really extend you know, the benefit of anti-VEGF, especially in tumors. You know. and, and, and it seems that the immunotherapy with the immune checkpoint inhibitor seems to be an extremely uh, um, uh, helpful you know, framework. And there are already some initial clinical data to support you know, that. And, and, and there is a lots of basic research. And I believe that even though actually uh, th th this line of research is, is not yet you know, fully successful, try to ut utilize an angiogenic factor like VEGF you know, in, in regenerative medicine, you know, at, maybe not as a single molecule, not as a single approach, could be still a very interesting, potentially very valid approach, which will require much research. And finally, this, I, I want to acknowledge a number of colleagues, actually. Uh, most of this work was done when I was at Genentech, you know, so over 25 years, so it would be very difficult to acknowledge everybody. Actually, this um, the more recent colleague at, Gen at UC, at UC San Diego, my lab, you know, members, as well as some collaborators, even work that, you know, I didn't have the time, you know, to describe in the interest of time. With this, I would like to conclude that thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, and we have just a few minutes for questions, so if you would please use the microphone uh, on either side, that would be great, and I see Chandon making his way. Excellent talk. Thank you. Dr. Ferrara, so at a time when we are now looking at cell reprogramming from, say, fibroblasts to vasculogenic cells with, say, E2V2, FOXC1, flea, flea one and this entire vasculogenic process not subject to any of the VEGF pathway modulators, how do you reconcile the two worlds? So here you are getting massive amounts of vascularization in within two weeks' time, and the, the check of which and the induction of which completely independent of the VEGF pathways. I'm just exaggerating just for the sake of a... Well, you know, I think, I think it, 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 reprogramming cells can yield you know, completely different result. We, we can really understand it. With the IPS cells, you can reprogram in whatever you want. It does not mean that this uh, is a physiological process. What we describe is, I believe, you know, more physiological mediator. There is a very strong, you know, genetic evidence that this is the case. If you knock out, you know, VEGF, you know, you don't have any blood vessels. If you knock out, you know, the VEGF receptor, you actually phenocopy, you know, that, you know. Reprogramming cells with the uh, modulating transcription factor could, could yield, you know, actually, you can certainly bypass, you know, this pathway. And, uh, that could be simply what this was missing in these early days when we use, you know, single angiogenic factors. So that's what I really I can say. But still, I, 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 once again, I think that, you know, therapeutically speaking, blocking of VEGF has been more useful than using VEGF itself. Still, uh, there has been a lots of effort to use, you know, IPS, you know, cells, for example, to treat, you know, macular degeneration, et cetera, and replace the stuff. But so far, this work has been very, very preliminary. Just, just a quick clarification, the pathway I refer to is not IPS. It is a direct yeah, yeah, but you know, and happens physiologically, shown. So this is not just an ectopic expression yeah. of factors resulting in a manipulated condition. This now happens physiologically. Well, is, is there any clinical data to show that? Is there any Not clinical, but experimental data. Well, you know, is we, we learned that, the, I, I don't mean that in any way yeah. to belittle this work, but what yeah. I learned in the last, you know, 30 years that, you know, there is a, between the preclinical data, even extremely tantalizing preclinical data, in clinical data, there is an abysmal difference. So I wish you all the luck or success, but yeah. I suspect you will find out exactly what I'm saying. It's very challenged to do that. But still, that's why we, we are researching, we try to do what seems to be unrealistic you know, at, the, uh, at the time when we do the work. Yes, please. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I have one quick question. Uh, what's the difference of function of VEGF in the tumor microenvironment compared to the normal wound healing microenvironment? Is there any important, second question is, is there any important cross-talking pathway you think the VEGF involved? 
Thank you very much. Well, that's, that's a great question. It's a very complex you know, topic, actually, which has never been fully resolved. I think, I think the, the, there is a many, many similarities between what VEGF does in a wound dealing in a, in a, in a, and in a tumor, actually. There was this uh, old you know, publication by Dvorak that, you know, that uh, called you know, tumorous wounds that do not heal. So this is a really illustrate already there is a lot of similarities, actually. VEGF is not clearly the only player in wound dealing. There is many other player actually. All the study trying to block you know VEGF in wound dealing showed an effect, but clearly not a very dramatic effect as compared to what you see in the tumor serine dye. You have a, a, a multiplicity of players, you have you know lo lots of you know inflammatory cells like a macrophage which bring in additional factor, you know, like in the neutrophils and factor, which is a, a, I think the cellularity could be a very important difference. I think actually we, we our work you know focus on neutrophils feels, you know, as a players and mediators of VEGF independent angiogenic, but there are clearly many other cell types that participate in this process. Tom? Yes, um, <clears throat> again, a wonderfully illuminating talk. Um, I had a question about most of your work seems to be much more impressive in blocking angiogenesis in terms of the promise than, let's say, stimulating angiogenesis with VEGF. We did some work uh, many years ago with VEGF, and our impression was the permeability factor properties <coughs> were perhaps not entirely beneficial. I wonder, uh, two questions, have you been able to separate out <coughs> with uh, different, uh, uh, <coughs> different uh, mutations, the permeability uh, properties of VEGF from the angiogenic properties, and what's your own thoughts on, um, on, on, on it, whether permeability, if you add VEGF in exogenously, whether that might uh, be responsible for some of the, uh, if you will, side effects or the lack of promise of, of or, or the lack of benefits of VEGF uh, clinically. Oh. This is a great question, actually. Now, I think there is a lots of uh, uh, molecular study which actually separate, you know, clearly the angiogenesis versus the permeability enhancing effect, actually. Actually, early work done by, actually, David Cherish group, actually, already showed that, you know, SARC seems to be involved, especially in the permeability enhancing effect, you know. And actually, there is another uh, group, you know, in Sweden, actually, showed that, actually, there is a, if a particular two phosphotyrosine in, in the VEGF receptor 2, which is different actually regulate, you know, permeability in angiogenesis. And actually, it looks that if you mutate, you know, the permeability enhancing pathway, it does not really have any significant effect in physiology. Well, if you block, you know, the angiogenic pathway, the mice will die. It looks that, you know, the permeability enhancing effect are very transient effect, you know, which result, you know, that depend on opening up of intracellular junction by formation or complex between SARC and V Kadir, you know. And, you know, VEGF can also induce, you know, an undesired permeability by a totally different mechanism, you know, which is making, you know, make, you know new blood vessels, you know, rapidly, which have failed to mature, so, so they are structurally abnormal. They lack, you know, pericyte, you know, and this is probably the, the indesired effect that you're referring to, which is exactly what you see, we see, for example, in the vessels, you know, in the disease, you know, retina, in tumors, you know, vessels which are structurally abnormal, you know, and the, and the, the, at this point, you know, the, the permeability enhancing function of EGF is probably not very important. The vessels, they don't need the permeability factor. They're already leak, you know, they don't care at all, etc. And this is, it could be one of the factors, actually, which limit, you know, the beneficial effect of VEGF, you know, in, in, uh, in the cardiovascular. Uh, but, you know, the truth is that, you know, probably there is more than that, because other factor which actually seems to be even stronger than VEGF as an angiogenic factor, like a basic FGF, equally fail in this arena. Uh, it, even though it does not induce vascular permeability. I think it's very clear that, you know, there is a number of issues. The preclinical model were not predictive at all. The preclinical model predict, you know, some spectacular effect which simply didn't, were not real in humans. And there could be a number of reasons. It could be for a bit, you need, you know, the, the animal seems to be much more responsive to an angiogenic factor because you don't have, you know, this uh, long-term atherosclerotic background, you know, diabetic, et cetera, et cetera. Or, or, or simply maybe that this was overly optimistic. This data may be overly simplistic, you know. One should also acknowledge that not everybody was able to reproduce this data. Probably, you're probably aware of that. And this was something that plagued, you know, this field. 
Shashwari, real quick. Yeah, a very small question. Excellent presentation, of course. So uh, my question to you is to, can you comment on the situation where diabetic retinopathy, which is massive angiogenesis, and will benefit from anti-VEGF uh, therapies, and on the other end, you have these diabetic wounds that are going to be severely requiring some VEGF therapy on it. So can you please make a comment on that? Well, I think in this case is the, the, the diversity of the microenvironment. And this looks like a simplistic term. In this case, it perfectly explained that. What happened in the microenvironment of the retina, you know, we have the strong hypoxia. And then, you know, the tissue attempted to, to make, you know, new blood vessels, which are extremely detrimental because these vessels are once again, you know, structurally abnormal. They like, you know, pericyte, they like, you know, the mural cells, you know. In this case, even the, the, this blood vessel very detrimental. Instead, you know, healing the you know, wound, you know, setting and making new blood vessels could be very beneficial. But once again, this is a, in, in, uh, induced by, this is in theory, because it was seen in animal model in humans, this was not really exactly seen. Maybe there is a greater level of complexity even in the diabetic wound, you know, that makes, you know, only one growth factor insufficient to achieve this effect. Thank you. Oh. Yes, Tom. I'd like to ask a question, and I'm grateful to Dr. Ferrara for consenting to talk to us in this excellent lecture. And I would like to ask one question. Uh, as I understand the physiology of vascular endothelial growth factor, it depends on the rate of hip formation. Uh, there's another factor in wounds, which is lactate, which also regulates the hip secretion by the same mechanism and inhibiting the uh, oxidation of HIF as it leaves the nucleus. I wonder if you have any feelings about that and the inhibition of wound healing or angiogenesis, either inhibition or stimulation. Thank you. Oh, this is, of course, a great, great idea. So now we understand the lactate this is this a critical, actually, uh, inducer of angiogenesis, actually. I very briefly came across lactate. I was no, not a lactate, you know, physiology. Very br briefly, we came across this molecule. We, we tried to identify some small molecule. We tried to... And uh, but, but lactate requires very high concentration but in, in, a, in, a, in, in a exercise, you know, m m muscle or in the wound, you know, reach extremely high concentration, like, you know, 10 to 50 millimolar, which is what is required to induce a, angiogenesis. So can play a role, can play a very important role in this pathophysiological circumstances, you know. Whether it's more important than the, the HIF, you know, system and the VHL, I think it's very difficult to tell, I think. I think they both, you know, play a very important role, or probably additive or synergistic role. Actually, biologists are rarely kind of, you know, one side, you know, really. They're always, you know, multiple player, you know. It's certainly lactate, I think it's extremely important. And now we understand the lactate has been shown to have actually a variety of other effects beyond the angiogenesis. There is a very nice publication in Nature by Menzitoff, you know, group show modulate immune function, modulate, you know, B cell, you know, and dendritic cells properties. So show what a critical regulatory molecule it is that goes certainly beyond the angiogenesis. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the Wound Healing Foundation Board of Directors, we'd like to thank you for being our 2017 Hunt Lecturer, and we'd like to present you this plaque. Oh, I'm very honored, really. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you.